Hi everyone, today we have a very special episode. Today we have someone who is neither a GP nor an LP, but he manages the relationship of the GPs and the LPs. He manages a group focused on private equity, venture capital, and startup relationships. He had been in the industry for more than 20 years, and he has worked with 700 companies, 500 venture capital and private equity firms, and has completed debt transactions over $11 billion in committed capital. He himself has invested in over 40 companies. His up and coming podcast is Venture Unlock, and it focuses on art of starting and running a venture capital firm. Welcome to SheVC. I'm your founder and host, Gayatri Sarkar. So today is an amazing day. We have Samir Kaji. He's the Senior Managing Director of First Republic. Super excited to welcome you, Samir. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> I wanted to have Samir for such a long time, and today I have him with him, yes. So here's the thing. The first very thing that I'm going to ask you is that you have been in the venture industry for over 20 years, now leading a large group at First Republic, focusing on venture capital, private equity, tech banking efforts, you started around the dot-com bubble. And over the past several years, you have had a particular focus, you know, um, early stage venture landscape, primarily micro VC, seed series A startups. How has venture capital changed over years? I would love to know your take, and especially from the capital deployment standpoint. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and uh, yeah, 20 plus years, which ages me. And, you know, I was thinking how young I am. And, and you I still look the, 25. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, on the Zoom, I can see the gray hairs. But uh, your, your question around venture and how it's changed, so, so it's dramatic. Uh, yeah. So when I started, and I, I will take it even further back than 99, 2000, which is the dot com bubble. And if you thought about venture then, it was very monolithic. So most, most firms kind of look the same multi-sector, multi-stage, four to six partners around a, a table investing a pool of capital. Average fund size is about $150 million. Yeah. And that's kind of how it was. And that was the predominant and primary source of capital for entrepreneurs. And that's where you went. If you needed capital, you went to a VC firm. A lot of things changed over the subsequent 20 years. And so let's just go to you know global financial crisis, which was 2008, 2009. Up until then, there was very little innovation in the venture industry. And there was three firms that I would categorize as innovators within venture, and they really jump-started what we're seeing right now. First was YC, which is the incubator model. Yes. Second was Andreessen and Horowitz in 2009 with the agency model. And then you had um, you know, First Round Capital, which was the early stage community model. Up until then, there was nothing like that and moving into the global financial crisis, we saw a few things happen. And it was a perfect storm that actually catalyzed a lot of change. So number one, you had firms that had grown too big, too fast, and had not performed during the 2000s. The second is you had a liquidity crunch brought on by the global financial crisis. Third is you had a drastic change in the, you know, the cost of starting a company, right? And so... Back in the 99, 2000, you needed a 150 or $200 million fund to be viable. Yeah. Uh, by 2009, when companies could launch a product with less than $500,000 in the bank, it was possible for a seed stage firm. So what do we see coming out of the global financial crisis? We saw a few things. Number one, um, investing in companies became more mainstream. So on one end of the spectrum, you saw venture capital, but then you also saw corporate venture arms growing and expanding. We saw non-traditional investors, hedge funds, different type of money managers, and you saw family offices invest because of the mainstream nature. Within venture, we saw segmentation. Mm -hmm. Segmentation in the, in the form of very early stage and the institutionalization of seed capital. So funds that were anywhere between 10 and 50 million, now investing in companies at the very earliest stages, really filling that gap between angel money and, and traditional series A money. And I remember in maybe late 2009, early 2010, there was only about 30 to 40 seed managers out there. We called them super angels back then. But you know, from my perspective, it was this natural transition into what we're seeing now. 
mm. which is innovation capital comes in all forms. Uh, within VC, you have um, various forms. You have still some platform funds, and the platform funds include Sequoia, Lightspeed, Excel, multi, multi-sector, multi-geography, multi-stage. You have sector-focused funds. Um, those are like an emergence, for example. And then you have this whole swath of what we would consider micro VC emerging managers. So this deep segmentation in the, in the venture market is something that I don't think goes away. I think we're going to see a big growth in the seed managers, which if you had asked me a few years ago, I, I would have said we're going to see a, a maturity and we're going to start to see attrition. I don't think that's the case anymore. There's only going to be a few that are those massive, let's say, multi-sector platforms, maybe 20 to 30 of them. And then a lot in the middle that are more um, focused on a particular strategy or stage. Wow, I love that. And since we are talking about the evolution, let's talk about rolling funds. You know, you wrote an amazing article on rolling funds. There are newer vehicles and platforms that are emerging to promote funds for emerging fund managers. And if someone is raising a first time fund now, what advice do you want to give him or her? And do you think Twitter followers are an important criteria to control the fund narrative? Well, there's a lot of questions embedded in there. So let, let's just talk about rolling funds, you know, which allow you to raise, you know, real time. Uh, you don't have to wait for a significant first close. You can use the 506C and do general marketing, right? So general solicitation is allowed under the 506C. I, you know, as a side note, I think it's an incredible innovation. Um, it took me a few weeks to understand it well enough to form an opinion. But right now, I think it's a great way for new managers to come in. Now, the question around you know, shouldn't, what should a fund manager think about or a prospective fund manager think about before starting? So the, the first question is, do you want to invest or do you want to raise and run for, for the long term? The average fund today, uh, seed fund, before it exits its last company, it's probably 12 to 15 years. You're, if you raise a fund with the idea of uh, running a firm, you're looking at a 20 year plus type of career running that firm. Is that something you really want to do? Have you committed yourself? Are you convicted in wanting to do that for the long term and being an investor and, and everything that comes with running a firm? Because it's not just investing. It's working with LPs. It's acting as a service provider for your companies. It's building a culture. It's building the team, working on ops. So I think that's the first question. What do you want to do? If you're not sure, something like a rolling fund is great. You don't have to commit for the long term. You have LPs that can put, put capital in for some period of time, you generally speaking, four to eight quarters, right? Um, yes, it brand makes a lot of difference. So what I would expect in terms of the rolling funds are the people that have brands are gonna be much more successful than people that have non-brands. By the very nature of people that are starting these rolling funds, most of them have long track records. That's what institutionals would require to raise a 20, 30, $40 million fund. And so a way to build your track record is by investing you know, a few million dollars into early stage companies, see how they track, and then hopefully upsize from there. But how do you do that if people don't know you? And especially if you're looking for money from people that don't know anything about you personally uh, because of the general solicitation. And so branding is really important. It's true in Instagram. It's true in all media channels that it does matter about brand. And so if you look at some of the folks that have been successful early on, it's because largely, not only they're, they're smart people, let's not take that one. They're smart people, they understand it, they're well connected. They often have come with some angel track records, but they're also, they have great media followings in terms of the ones that have really taken off. So yeah, I think Twitter is an important medium for venture capital, right? Like every industry operates differently. VC is Twitter, right? VC, by, by and large. Um, and if you think about uh, VCs and Twitter, there's a lot of good that can come out of it, but fundamentally it creates the brand and the thought process for any LP is if they have a great brand, they're going to see the, the best companies. The countervailing force, of course, is if you have too big a brand, you also see a lot of noise and how do you sift through the noise and, and create a less distorted signal to noise ratio where you see the companies, but you, you still spend enough time with each given opportunity to give it a chance to look at. Um, but yeah, I think just going back, you know, to the earlier point about where rolling funds are going to go, I wouldn't be surprised to see 
entertainers, people in sports actually start wow. to enroll in. Wow, I think that's an important take. So you think like entertainers, and because that's kind of my area, sports players and TMT. So uh, I'm I'm very surprised that you you pointed that part. Like sports and entertainers will be coming into the rolling fund. I'll not be surprised if Snoop Dogg is raising money if uh, Shaquille O'Neal, and I think he doesn't need rolling fund to raise money, but still, it's it's a very interesting perspective that he said and. I, I know that now my next question will be like, do you see further movement in emerging fund managers? I mean, you already answered my question, but you know, micro and pre-seed funds are becoming institutional asset class and we are just uh, talking about that. So what kind of further movement uh, will be coming into this industry? Besides Snoop Dogg and Elonial starting their own rolling funds. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, I mean, the celebrity thing is, is one thing it, it, and it's not new. It started with, you know, folks like Ashton Kutcher and Snoop and yeah. the late Kobe Bryant and others that have, have started. I think this just allows an easier channel to do it and add their name value to get into real interesting companies. But if you look at where we are in the, uh, the scope of micro VC and emerging manager, we're 10, 11 years in now, you know, in terms of it becoming mainstream. Um, and we, we, we've seen it come in different waves. The first wave was a lot of generalists, um, you know, folks like Jeff Clavier that started to fund when there were very few seed managers out there so you can invest in consumer enterprise. And then we started to shift toward more uh, specific uh, focuses, right? So a, a certain sector. And a, that was largely a function of LPs saying, wait a second, if you're going to do this, you have, to ha you have to be good at something. What, is, what are you the best in the world? And is it a certain sector? Like, why are you different? And then we started to see different models, right? We started seeing studio models. Uh, we started to see, you know, different incubator models. We saw things like now rolling funds. But what we're really still lacking is a major, major deficiency in, in diversity, right? And, and, and what it ends up doing is you have capital that's going to entrepreneurs that doesn't have this, the right perspective or at least the well-rounded perspective to invest in some of those investable ideas by entrepreneurs that are starting companies that are really focused on a certain socioeconomic group, a certain, a certain a, a, a ge geographic group. And so ultimately, I think that diversity is gonna be a big part of that next wave. Mm -hmm. um, I am hoping, let, let, me, let me put it this way. I think it's for the health of the venture and entrepreneur market to have much, much more diversity. Right now, still only about 9% of investing professionals are women, 3% are African American, about the same in terms of Latin American. And what you miss out by not having that is, is diversity of thought. And so I do think we're gonna see an amplification of those things, along with continued progress with things like new models and geographic, so not just Silicon Valley, right? So yeah. a few years ago, the whole trope was, you have to be in Silicon Valley to start a great company. I think that largely has been eliminated as a thought, right? Especially with COVID. But look at if you look at some of the the, the more recent large exits, they've actually a lot of them have actually come from outside of Silicon Valley. Sil Silicon Valley's stronghold in terms of total capital into companies continues to reduce. So I'm very, very optimistic about the next 10 years in the continued innovation of the industry. But yeah, I mean, if you were to ask me right now, diversity and geography are two big ones. Now, since we are talking about diversity, I just want to know your thought points. Like, what are the systemic changes that are required to bring more capital to women funders and women founders? Well, LPs need to write, start writing uh, checks out of their pocketbooks. I mean, there's there's a lot of discussion, and since um, you know, obviously the the last six months, five months now, we've we've had a lot of talk. Um, there are really interesting things that are being done. Diversity writer that act one put together where, you know, in, as part of the term sheet by some of the larger firms out there, they will, you know, on a best efforts basis, get a underrepresented investor onto the cap table. Great, okay, that's systemic. But we need to see more capital coming in from LPs to, to funders. Um, Cor Corrigin and now Alpaca Ventures, you know, put in two and a half million dollars to back underrepresented LPs. We need a hundred more of those, right? We need, more capital going in, and in turn, what that's going to create is more capital going into underrepresented founders. Yeah, I I actually talked about this diversity mandates with 
corporate ventures also, and um, spoke with a lot of other institutional fund managers and LPs. Uh, do you think we need to tie performance uh, with diversity? And will that bring a change? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there should be something that, that connects it uh, where performance of the individual um, or the way they're graded out is based on a level of diversity that they're incorporating into you know, their platforms. As an entrepreneur, you know, do I want to see diversity on my cap table? Absolutely. So I think it's also entrepreneurs that are you know, raising the flag and pounding the table for more underrepresented capital on their, on their capital tables. If those two things happen, where you have LPs pulling and pushing mm -hmm. capital in, and you have entrepreneurs, you know, I think it's, I think it, it's going to happen, but make no mistake. It's going to take time. It's this is take. not flipping a switch. I mean, we've talked about the lack of female um, representation in, in investing circles for a long, long time. It's yeah. gotten better, but 9%, yeah. like, what are we celebrating? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm the one of the few or the only uh, female person of color GP in a sports fund. So let's, I mean, this is the situation in, terms of diversity um, in other verticals also, you know, investments side. Um, I, so since we're talking about rolling funds and I would love to know the LP dynamics also, like do you see non-institutional investors uh, moving into fund investments since the small cap public equity is, is shrinking now? Yeah, I, I do. And we, we've seen this. We're, we've seen much more capital go, going in from individuals and uh, family offices. I mean, most first time funds, over 70% of the capital raised is by non institutional. I mean, that's just institutionals go later and later. They can, they can afford to wait. And so we are seeing much more capital. Again, innovation and in tech is much more mainstream. People want to invest. There's a prestige factor of investing in startups. Um, in, in terms of like the rolling funds and how does that look? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the case right now is there's plenty of liquidity. This is not 08, 09. And, and with fiscal and monetary policy, a lot of money is being pumped into the systems. So as an individual, I have more capital, but less places to put it to get any type of attractive yield, fixed income, public securities. The pricing isn't great. The yield's not great. So where do I get alpha in my portfolio? Well, I'm going to look at the private sector. And so we started to see more capital translate to moving into privates. Venture still is a very small asset class. People don't you know, think about it as much. But VCs raise about right now about $50 billion a year in total capital. Let's put SoftBank aside for a second and that, not count the vision fund. But $50 billion. Put that in perspective. In 19, I think it was 99 or 2000, I forget the number, $100 billion was raised by VC funds. So double, and at that point, there was what, 250 million uh, people on the internet. Today, there's close to 5 billion, right? So we are in a very different point, but it's still a tiny asset category. Yeah. If you look at traditional buyout, it's one-tenth of that uh, in terms of total capital raised generally each year. So I, I, I think we will see more money, but people need to understand it's a, it's a long-term game, it's a liquid. Most funds do not return the type of capital necessary to be happy, which is really a two and a half to three X but it's not an index game. You have right. to invest. It's a power law game where a small group of funds and a small group of companies drive the, the bulk of returns. Yeah. Since we're talking about the power law game, now let's, let's look on the other side. Like, you know, venture capital is all about identifying patterns in time, yet some of the bigger ideas are unpredictable. And sometimes, you know, those investment decisions can be non-consensus among partners. Now to invest in such unpredictable big ideas, one has to learn and see things differently, analyze the market that others don't necessarily find it exciting. So now that more LPs, including family offices and institutional funds, want to get into direct deals, how do you think they look at the direct investing market? Well, everyone wants direct investments. I mean, if most of the family office individuals will ask for co-investment rights. I, I, I don't think it's a great idea for most. Uh, I think it doesn't do, it, it does a certain level of disservice to the difficulty of investing in companies and getting meaning, meaningful returns. Um, I expect to see more of that. We are seeing, you know, now these solo capitalists or people that run massive family offices that become funders. And, you know, the, for them, 
The key could be I can move quickly. I don't have the same economics as a venture investor. Um, but I don't think it's a good idea for most people to do early stage direct investing. It's, it's hard. It is, it is incredibly hard. It's better to invest in a fund that you believe in the manager and over time get a sense of how that manager operates, how they think about things. Pattern recognition is an interesting topic. Um, on one hand, it is important. So you can't discount, hey, I've seen this movie before. It may or may not work. The problem with um, pattern recognition, though, for a lot of venture investors and putting aside the individuals for a second, is that the algorithm can break over time. It can be suboptimized. There's false positives and negatives that, that are along the way, which mean that you know today something might be true and correct that wasn't before and vice versa. And yeah. if I'm making decisions without constantly challenging that algorithm or pattern recognition, eventually that pattern recognition is going to be useless and is going to be self-defeating. Um, but it is important as long as you continue to tweak it. And as an individual, you just don't get enough shots at goal to develop any type of pattern recognition. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's a really difficult thing. Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of very incredible uh, way to put it together because, um, you know, pattern recognition and then there's question about liquidity, you know. So let's talk that part, like, especially the, during this unusual time, how do you approach the liquidity question to incoming LP, especially the individual investor you were talking about, who may be more averse to a liquidity? You know, how important do you feel uh, also the time diversification? I'll talk about the time diversification, but I would, I would specifically want to know your take because you work with PEs and VCs. And um, um, when this family offices specifically, when they look for a liquidity position, because a lot of times they're like, hey, I want, I'm interested to write a $10 million check, but I don't want to hold on for five to seven years or 10 years, especially if you're investing in early stage VC funds. So what's your take on that? Well, if you don't want the liquidity, you, sh you shouldn't invest. I mean, that's the nature of the game. Uh, yeah, now there are opportunities for quicker liquidity in, in, in some respects with secondary offerings. And yeah. there are people that do sell um, a portion to get some liquidity to, to investors quicker. But if you're not comfortable with at least you know five to seven years of your money locked up with very little coming back, venture is not, it's just not a great asset category. Um, that's why it's not always the best asset category for retail investors. For a retail investor, that, need, that may need the liquidity. Maybe it's to buy a house. Maybe it's for a move. Maybe it's for a rainy day. Maybe they, want, they don't want to give up um, the optionality of investing in more liquid asset classes if the market becomes better. In, in that case, you just don't want to in, invest in, in venture, right? I mean, I think that if you want to invest in venture, it's because you have a longer term um, mm -hmm. viewpoint on it as an asset category, the fact that you think over a long period of time, it's going to bring you alpha returns, which, you know, it has relative to others, especially if you're in the top 10 to 25% or top decile, top quartile funds. Um, but you also have to think about how much of your capital do you want to tie up? So most people I talk to and myself included, I'm not putting a hundred percent of my capital into venture. Um, you know, I'd like to be boring with, you know, capital management personally. And so it's more like 10%. And I can, I can afford to take 10% illiquidity for 8, 10, 12 years. And I'm totally fine with that. I think a lot of people go through that same calculus of saying, what portion of my capital am I okay with being illiquid if it comes with potential high upside in the future? And it's part of a longer term game plan. Yeah. Um, but if someone doesn't have those things where they're, they're not thinking venture is a long-term thing for them, they don't have any uh, capital that they can afford to be a liquid for a long time, don't invest in venture. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Now, since we are talking about diversification, I want to talk about a different kind of diversification. So we are seeing a lot of full stack VC funds that are coming up, raising $100, $200 million, and then again raising you know, larger amounts for later stage rounds. So how important do you feel time diversification vintage year is when thinking about a venture oriented portfolio? Well, it's, it's, it's a funny point in that when I first started in venture, you know, funds or firms would raise new funds every three to four years and it's truncated uh, down to a couple of years for flagship funds. And then in between often there's, you know, specific funds that they raise for like, Oh, I raise a opportunity fund and I'll raise a sector fund and I'll raise, 
a, you know, let's say a digital uh, fund and, you know, all these different products come to market and it's this continuous fundraise. And, you know, from an LP perspective, you know, I talked to a ton of LPs, they don't love it. They would like to have some diversification. And more importantly, the, the view is if you're raising every two years, are you rushing on deals? Are you really taking your time to be delivered in terms of your investing deployment um, versus, you know, just trying to get to the next fund as quick as possible? So it, it's less about time diversification for me, because from my standpoint, if you see really great deals, you are not not going to invest in them just because you feel like you need to move into calendar year 21. I don't think that's good business. But the way things typically work out is to be a good investor and to be responsible. Generally speaking, it's a two or three year deployment, which does give you some diversification, both in terms of entry and maybe mm. entry prices and what's happening macro, but also at the exit too. Um, because the two, like the reality during uh, any fund, which is 10 to 15 years, is you're going to have an up cycle and you're going to have a down, down cycle. Yeah. The best is the down cycle happens when you're investing and the up cycle is when the companies are mature enough to exit. Mm. But you can't time these things, right? So you try to mitigate as much as possible by having some level of diversification over years. Yeah. And since we are talking about uh, the fund management part, let's talk a little bit about recycling. You know, GPs are extending the capital pool to deploy. So what's your take on the, you know, the strategy benefits, especially from the LP side? Um, I would love to know. And also, you know, there is a, what's your take on distributing cash versus distributing public securities and uh, the benefits that the LPs can get? Well, let's, let's take the first question. So the, the concept of recycling is an age old one. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think every manager should aspire to get to 100% invested. An average fund, especially a small fund, 22 to 25% of the capital will go into things like fund expenses, management fees. Yeah. Those are earning zero. Doesn't earn anything. You're not investing. it. So if only 75% of my capital is being invested in companies, how are you going to get me a three and a half X or, or three X, right? Three X net, which is three and a half X gross. Yeah. Which means for a $30 million fund to get to a three X net, you're looking at $105 million of total distributions coming back to the fund, right? Yeah. At 105, if you're only investing 23 of it, you're really looking more like five X or a four and a half to five X. And that's really hard to do. Yeah, so hard. <laughs> you have to recycle capital if you can. Now it's hard because there's two things that make it difficult. The first is the timing of when those exits happen. Typically your smallest exits are for first. So even if you have a 0.5X or a 1X, it doesn't really move the needle to getting to 100%. Um, and most seed managers will invest most of the capital in terms of new investments in the first couple of years, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the key then there is, well, how do you get closer to that 100% assuming that you know, let's work under the assumption that you want to get to 100%. You can under reserve for future management fees. Mm -hmm. So instead of reserving at, after year two, 16%, I might only reserve 5%. And understand that distributions in the future can take care of those management fees in the future. So I, I optimize on my investable capital during my investment period, which is generally speaking, years one to four. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, it's hard. The other thing uh, I, should have, I should have touched on that makes it a little bit tough is you have a lot of individuals and family offices that are in your, in your fund. So you're going out to raise fund too. And people are looking around and saying, oh, you know, there's no DPI. You've never distributed a dollar. Well, sometimes it feels good as a fund manager to put some points on the board and says, well, no, I've distributed money already. Look, I'm in the top 10% DPI. Therefore, you should give me money. It's a terrible idea, and it, that's a broken and misaligned way of thinking. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, all the early money, to the degree you get, you're not at 100% invested, should go toward uh, new investments and follow-ons. Uh, the other question I think you asked, and remind me if I'm incorrect, is what do you do with stock? Yeah, um, do you distributing dollar? cash versus distributing public. And generally speaking, people will distribute shares, right? Um, most fund managers are not in the business of timing when a stock has hit its peak or it's at a trough, right? So I'd rather just distribute the stock to you. You decide as an LP hmm. what you want to do with it, whether you want to keep it or not. 
I would want to avoid a situation where I sell it, distribute it, like three months later, the stock goes up by 100%, and you as an LP saying, well, why don't you distribute the stock? I was going to keep it. I'm bullish on the company. Mm, I love that answer. Um, there's, I, I always get different takes on this, but it's very interesting to understand the LP standpoint, and um, and some some LPs have certain you know um, emotional attachment to certain kind of stocks. So um, since we are talking about venture capital and LP management, what do you think? Like, what are the biggest misconceptions you are seeing about venture capital and venture firms currently, especially the the smaller VC firms? Well, there's a few. I think the first one is people under underestimate how the amount of time that goes into things that are not investing. You know, a lot of people I talk to are like, yes, you know, I've invested, I've been an angel investor. This is what I want to do. My passion is to back entrepreneurs and help those entrepreneurs. And then you look at a typical day and gone are the days where VCs were, you know, spend half their time on golf courses. And that's what people used to think. <laughs> They're like, oh, the guys on the golf course, these are at the Maldives. The reality is seed managers, especially are working as hard as anybody I've seen. I get emails on Saturday nights, Friday, you know, Friday at 9 p.m. while they're out with dinner because there's so much to do. Yeah. The firm operations take up a lot of time. The time with your LPs take up a lot of time. Managing the funnel, managing team. You're running a company. You're writing checks versus code. Sometimes some people are actually writing code as well. <laughs> but it, at the end of the day, as a startup company, and I think people really, really under, un, underestimate. I think the other thing that people um, often forget is the economics of a small fund. You know, you do not make a lot of money until much, much later on. And much later on usually is when you're stacking funds and you have multiple uh, funds paying management fees and or when you get into carry. Hmm. A, $25 million fund that's charging 2.5% is $625,000 in annual management fees. Let's say you have your one partner and then you have some other expenses. You, and, you know, after all, you know, your rent and your other salaries, maybe you have an associate, maybe you have, you know, a, a principal, maybe you have any, another partner. There are emerging managers that I know that are making less than $150,000 a year living in the Bay Area, which effectively is at the poverty line of what you need to make to live in that area. And so, you know, I, I think those two things, um, you know, I talk about it all the time, uh, about just the time and the economics, and it's still something that is, that is lost on a lot of people. I think the other thing is just the amount of time fundraising. Mm. Fundraising is no longer this episodic process where you raise every couple of years, you're constantly fundraising. All you're doing is, adjusting the dial left or right during fundraise it's always all the way to the right between funds it's still on but it's slightly maybe to the left of the midpoint but you're constantly talking to lps about the next fund your story and if you're trying to raise institutional capital you're probably spending one to two years before they actually write a check and so um yeah those are those are the main mi misconceptions i'm sure there's others <laughs> Totally agree. Now let's come to the most important thing, which is the Venture Unlock podcast. Let's talk about the podcast. You're starting this amazing podcast about starting and running a venture fund and your Twitter feed is amazing. I just love what, whenever you're tweeting, you are giving out so much of knowledge and your experience, you know, so would love to know your take, like why you are starting the podcast and what are you looking at uh, uh, market and especially uh, towards your guests, like, what kind of guests you're uh, inviting? I know a couple of the guests who have came. Um, you have already informed that on your tour. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. And I'll set a little bit of context. So when I, I, you know, my career has been in banking. I was at Silicon Valley Bank for 13 years, working with entrepreneurs in the last couple of years, working with VCs. In 2012, I moved to First Republic Bank. Um, and our entire thesis was built around venture is changing. There's a shift in paradigm. And the shift is going to be a lot of new managers coming to market, backing entrepreneurs. Now, there's no way I knew it was going to be what it is today, which is like 1,500 funds or firms in the U.S. that have been formed. But like our business was fundamental to two principles. Number one, we wanted to be the ones that planted our flag with emerging managers. And number two, we wanted to build a service model 
that wasn't just based on banking. We just felt like that was a commodity and we wanted to help people get off the ground and scale their franchises. And so a lot of what I started doing is working with GPs, helping them think through all aspects of building a firm. And throughout that process, now we work with about 550 venture firms of which 75% are emerging managers. We learned a lot about the acute pain points of both GPs and LPs. And it was kind of the same. We were in this unique perch to hear from both of them and, and kind of guide both sides. And so about a year ago, I, you know, I wanted to finally get off the, you know, the, the schneid and, and start a podcast. And I said, this is a perfect way to get better capital and more diverse capital into the market, informing emerging managers um, and using the unique place in the ecosystem that we sit to get the right type of guests and thought leaders to help people build their firms and help LPs, by the way, also allocate capital in a more informed way. And so that was that was the uh, the thought process behind the podcast. The podcast launches officially on September 29th. Um, we have some great guests on tap, mainly GPs and LPs. But we're also looking at a whole swath of type of GPs. We're looking at people that were operators before people that have been in the industry for 20 years, people that are brand new, rolling fund managers, underrepresented, people in different geographies. We want as much perspective as possible because the world tomorrow, and my hope is that venture becomes really democratized to a degree that no one looks exactly the same. And we have such a great funding environment for entrepreneurs, but to do that, we need to get as many perspectives to the table as possible. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a that's that's a great platform. I'm super excited to listen to this. So thanks a lot, Samir, coming to SheVC, and I'm super excited. Congratulations for coming on the other side and joining the podcast world. So thanks a lot, Samir. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. This is.